Okay, so what I wanted to do tonight, um, as Ravi mentioned, I had a book come out, the most recent book called Escape Velocity, and I want to I want to introduce it to you, but I'm going to put a spin on it, which says because there's a there's a kind of a established enterprise um, tilt to the book, but there's two reasons why I think it's important for the folks in this room. One is your exit may be to an established enterprise; it may not be an IPO to the point just that Jeannie just made, in which case your baby is going to be inside the belly of a whale. And, and, and I want to talk a little bit about what that's about. Um, also, it's interesting, if you get a little bit of traction with your company and you get your first business model working, you will discover that you've become a whale. Not a very large whale, but, but if you want to have a new engine come into existence in an established franchise, even if it's a five or $10 million a year franchise, you'll experience some of the same issues. So I want to share those with you. And I also want to use this as a chance to bring in the question around uh, what does the chasm model have to do with social media? The answer is not much. It really needs a different model. And I, I want to bring that into the discussion as well. So a bunch of stuff to share with you. I, I want to kick it off. I'm, the book is organized around something called the hierarchy of powers. And I, and I want to I want to kind of use that as a framework for the for the talk. Um, it's as as Ravi said, it's in a, a sequence of a, of a bunch of books. The difference is the first three books, and really Crossing the Chasm primarily, they were about leveraging disruptive innovations, breaking into developed markets, and then this whole thing about how do you cross chasms. It's very startup oriented and also very B2B oriented. So it was a B2B. When, when this stuff uh, started coming in, into the market, there wasn't really a consumer market for new tech. Consumer was way late in the game. So it was always, it was always B2B. One of the things that's really different about the last 10 years is that's been flipped. And, and that's why you need some additional work with the models. But um, the new tech challenge that I want to talk about is this issue of we have a lot of established enterprises. Um, their challenge is actually to break out of their old game. So think about Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, SAP, Oracle. I mean, you know, HP, Accenture. I mean, really, 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 really uh, great companies. Feels like they're kind of doing the same thing decade after decade after decade. And, and, and you'd say, well, so what? Well, because tech is moving on. And, and, and so it's like, well, why do I care? Well, part of the problem you care is, we used to just plow these companies under. But it's like at some point you think, man, I'm not sure we get to plow them under because we're no longer the hot market for the next generation of companies. The hot market for this next generation of companies is in Asia. It's not here. It's in Latin America, it's not here. So, so I think we have a bigger stake in our existing franchises than we might think. So anyway, that's what, what Escape Velocity was about. I was thinking about um, companies that did not escape, and this does age me, but for those of you who have, you know, have a certain age, uh, some, many of these companies at the beginning well, they've never even heard of, but those are all companies which no longer exist. Okay? And these were, at, in their time, these were really, really serious players in, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the industry. They were not bad companies. These were not like the failures. These were the winners. Right? Now, having said that, I think anybody at, under the age of about 40 would say, Jeffrey, wrong century. You know, dude, come on, come on. It's the 21st century. Step up. So what I did for the 21st century is I just started looking at the NASDAQ for this, for this, for this century, the last decade. And so basically what this shows, now this is Microsoft, Intel, and SAP. And basically the thing you want to watch for is because in each of these slides is the number up here. This says that's the highest number on the y-axis. Okay? So this says in 100% variability, the NASDAQ over 10 years went up about 55%, Microsoft about 5 okay? Microsoft. For God's sake, Microsoft. Not, uh, Intel, not quite zero. Intel, I mean, come on, right? I mean, SAP, okay, way to go, SAP. You stayed with the NASDAQ, right? Okay, uh, you look a bit, now, this, now we're up to 150%, but Cisco's actually going the wrong way there. Uh, IBM, okay, okay, IBM, good, it looks about okay, I don't know what it means, but okay. Uh, ooh, Nokia, okay, that was sort of a. Apple iPhone moment, right? RIM would be worse if I had RIM up here, right? The, the, you heard about them today. Okay. Uh, Adobe looks like they were getting kind of an escape. Well, maybe not. Back, back, okay, kind of back to there. Again, IBM, Cisco, Nokia, and Adobe. 
Not bad company to be in, right? This is HP. These are the Mark Hurd moments. Boom. Okay. No, the, so we've had some recent moments. Uh, Oracle. This is a genuine. This is a genuine change. Oracle has fundamentally changed its value, and so that strategy of acquiring other companies and bringing them together and consolidating the industry, the market has said, you know what? That's that's a real deal. Okay. Uh, EMC. This, I think, is probably VMware kind of stuff. I'm not sure EMC itself has changed very much. NetApp, nice spike here. We can't quite tell if we're getting escape or if that was just kind of like a, uh, you know, a moment where kind of the world was really great. Uh, these are now 400%. These are much bigger deals. So Google, okay, boom. But probably still playing its first hand, right? Just it's like, okay, that was its, that's its big play. Uh, eBay, uh, oops, 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 election period for Meg. Uh, but you know, I think you got to give, I think you got to give John Donahoe a bunch of credit here, right? That looks like real progress because this is now 400%, right? So that's that's real progress. Uh, Citrix. Huh? Look at, check this out. Uh, uh, huh? 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 Yeah. I mean, the world believes that Citrix is changing the world. I mean, I, mean, I think I think that we, you know, they're they're buying the act. They're, you know, this whole thing around the virtualization of the desktop and, and kind of where that might lead in the future. I think it's real. Autodesk. You got to give Carl Bass and his team credit. They really did uh, create a bunch of separation. Again, there's some cloud stuff in, in the back end of this as well. Intuit. I think the world thinks they're going to get this SaaS model right for for small business. Yahoo. The thing is ironic about Yahoo is it's done better than Intel. <laughs> what? But 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 it just it had this heck of a heck of a uh, a, a spike there, but it's it's kind of just back to, to to kind of where it was. And then there are the two kind of stories of the valley. Well, one is actually from the northwest, and this is now greater than a thousand percent. So this is Amazon going to thirteen hundred percent, and this is largely on the back of. AWS, Amazon's web services, okay? And then this company you may have heard of, Apple, who basically 5,000%. And you think, what in God's name happened? And what happened here was Apple added three wholly new earnings engines in one decade. So they had the Mac, which was becoming an unearnings engine. They added the iPod and the music industry. Then they added the iPhone, and they completely revolutionized the, the mobile device world and, and the App Store and the whole economy around that. So two ecosystems built on the back of two very compelling devices. And now we have the iPad, which is a fourth, a fourth uh, thing and, and the fastest growing consumer product ever. So, oh, excuse me. So if you look at that, the, the amazing thing there is four times, three times they created escape velocity from their own from their own gravitational field because what's hard to do is to turn is to somehow overcome the inertial resistance of whatever business you're currently in to bring on these things. And so 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 you look at that and you think, okay, so what's going on? Well, the conventional wisdom that SOC people always say is, well, Apple and Amazon outperformed their peers. That's just that's just not that does not make sense to me in English because I would say that Microsoft and Intel and Cisco know more about performance in the classic meaning of performance than Apple does. Okay? They're performance cultures. They perf they're unbelievable performance engines. So I don't think it's about performance. So if it's not about performance, what the heck is it about? And I think it's about power. What I think what I think the, the investment community is doing is they're saying, look. Apple's prospects for future earnings are wildly different than they were eight years ago. Microsoft's are not. Microsoft has enormous power, but it's kind of the same power it had 10 years ago. Same thing with Intel. Lots of power. In fact, with Intel, I think the reason it's kind of going down, it's challenged a bit, is people are wondering, man, in a world of mobile, I'm not so sure you have as much power as you used to have. You might actually be losing power, even though you have this unbelievable franchise. And so what the investment community is saying, although I'm not sure people are listening to, is investors care about future returns, which means they have to care about your present power. Now, the fact that you have an established franchise is powerful. But that's already built into the stock price. So the question now is, how would you change the stock price of a big company? And I think it's by adding a new earnings engine. A new, a net new earnings engine that could be at scale. I mean, like could be 10 to 20 to 30 percent of total revenues. Big, big. So Xbox isn't quite big enough yet for Microsoft, and it's not clear it's going to be that good of an earnings engine. But it was a bet on one for sure. Um, Cisco got into unified communications, but that was more at the beginning of the, of the decade. I think that's built into their stock price. You know, Oracle.
Well, I do think adding all those extra app companies is a new earnings engine. So they have the database, which they've always had. Now they have the apps. They never really had apps before. So you say, okay, I see what they're doing. But the, the reason why I think it's important here is in order to add a net new earnings engine, companies have to innovate in a new category. And if they just try to acquire it from the outside, the problem is there's nothing to plug it into on the inside. And so when you see these companies get acquired and they kind of just get dissolved. This is the belly of the whale problem. The whale, the whale actually digests the company and there's proteins floating somewhere in the blood system, but there's, there's no, it's, it's gone, it's gone. And so I think what has to happen is there has to be organic innovation in large companies, which, which may be done by, by bringing in a technology team from the outside, but sooner or later to get to real scale, there probably has to be acquisitions, but it's organic plus, plus uh, the two together. But the drill is, and this is where my conversations with exec teams and big public companies are, are, are focusing more and more. You got to stop talking about performance. I mean, you're, we're, we're, we're at the third, asymptot the third uh, the standard deviation of improving performance. You're not going to improve performance very much more. So if we're going to get improvements, it's got to come from someplace else. I think it's got to come from power. The problem is when you talk about power, people go, power. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, like. How do we talk about power without like the Avengers or you know you know <laughs> Harry Potter you know what where are we going so that's where we got this concept of saying okay look I think investors have thought about power decoded power I think you guys actually know about power you're just not using a very good framework so the intent was again once again to say let's put a framework in place to have the conversation so this is the framework and I think this frame we use this framework with more David I was startup so I want you guys to learn this framework for yourself I also want you though to think about it in terms of Facebook the question Jeannie had about Facebook, what, 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 what was happening right then? And in general, when you see stuff happening in the stock market, I be, everybody says, well, that's because of something, some problem in performance. I believe it's always a problem in power. So I want you to be able to think about it coherently. So here's how it plays out. What is category power? Category power is when you're in a, in, in a category that is going to grow no matter what. This thing is taken off. And if you're in the category your company is going to grow. I mean, unless you completely screw it up, okay? Which some people are gifted at doing, but, but you know, uh, but in general, it, uh, and conversely, if you're in a category that's sinking, I don't care how good a job you do, man, I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, Kodak, right? I mean, it's like really hard. Nathan. Why do you call it secular? Oh, so, yeah, good point, thanks. So, yeah, 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 it's like, it's like, you know, perhaps orthodox or, 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 or no. so secular growth is, is, is it's a financial analyst term. It means one time only As, and, and it's opposite is cyclical. So most categories in, in their mature state are, have cyclical growth. They go up and down. Secular growth is no, no, no. We're going from zero to a hundred, and we're not. And once we get to a hundred, then we'll go cyclical. But it, it's a big deal. And, and venture capital is all about investing in that first burst of secular growth. That's how venture creates its returns. Okay, and it's from the category. Now, once you're in the category, the question is, how good a position does your company have in the category? And this is where we get phrases like the gorilla or a chimp or a monkey. I mean, you're kind of, and by the way, all three companies can have success, but they play very different strategies. Uh, but the key idea from the gorilla's point of view is a partner would go out of their way to send the gorilla business. So if you're a gorilla, your cost of sales is lower than your competitors. You're, 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 you, you get brought into deals. You get to negotiate from a position of strength. It's a sweet deal, right, uh, uh, going, going forward. If you're not a gorilla, then you have to figure out some way to get competitive advantage for your company more locally. And, and classically, the way you do that is you go into a market segment that's probably too small for the gorilla to fight for and too complicated. And that segment's kind of up for grabs because they're going, well, I guess I could go with the gorilla because they're sort of the safe buy, but the gorilla doesn't really do what I need done. I would really love to have somebody come and do what I really need done, but man, I mean, it's, it's hard work. So, so the drill there is if you can, if you can build a, loyal, a, a, a commitment around a, a very specialized commitment to that segment, the segment will commit to you and will defend you against the gorilla. I mean, the fact that Mike, the Apple was around to invent the iPod and, and, and the iPhone and the iPad 
was because of the Mac. And the fact that the Mac was around with 2% PC share going to 1%, basically completely unviable for a privately owned operating system, was because there were segments that said, you will take my Macintosh from my cold, dead fingers. Right? And, and so, so there was a loyalty there that, that kept them in the game, which was amazing. This power allows any company of any size to create a world in which your customers will defend you. Okay? If you can get enough of the customers in a real segment uh, to be on your side. So, so comp I'm in the good category. How, how powerful am I in the category? If I'm not powerful in the category as a whole, how powerful am I in the segment that I'm most interested in serving? And then we get down to offer power, which is just how cool is your product? How, you know, what are its properties? How competitive is it against the other products out there that claim to be able to do the same stuff? And this idea of creating unmatchable offers, big deal, as opposed to good enough offers, uh, which is most product development in large companies is all about good enough. And most product development startups is about unmatchable. If it's not unmatchable, you're probably wasting your time in a startup. So one of the things you gotta do in a startup, it's interesting, in order to minimize your risk, you have to take massive product risk. Because you're basically like a hermit crab with no shell. Right? So you're like running like hell across, across the bottom of the ocean. You're trying to find a shell really fast, but you better have something really, really good uh, to, to uh, keep you uh, in, in the game, as it were. And then execution power. Execution really is performance. So you say, wait a minute, Jeff. I thought that was the thing that we're not going to worry about. But this is actually performance power, execution power. And the power in execution has to do with a particular case, at least the power I'm interested in, is what happens with respect to a strategic initiative and the tipping point. And I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. But this idea of getting to a tipping point is something that startups intuitively understand, venture intuitively understands, and established organizations intuitively screw up. Right? And all their systems actually are designed to incent them to screw it up. And all their filters that they manage performance by say, man, you're, you're screwing up. If, imagine, for example, you're a bicyclist, and you start in a race, and you're kind of bicycling on the level, and you're going pretty damn fast. And people are going, you're, you're a good bicyclist, right? And then you, you start a strategic initiative, which means you're starting to go uphill. Because whenever you do anything strategic, the world's kind of going, OK, all right. But, but they're beginning to get a little queasy, so they're not quite supporting you as much, which and you experience that as every, it's a little harder to get stuff done, a little harder to hire people, a little harder to get funding, a little harder to do stuff. As you're going up, 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 it gets harder and harder. Now you're, now you're pedaling pretty goddamn slowly. If I'm measuring you on miles per hour, I'm saying, Man, what happened to your bicycling skills, dude? You, you're not a very good bicyclist, are you? You, you probably should like get off the bike, right? Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, if you, but if I if they let me get to here, I can bicycle like the with the best of them. Right? I'm now going downhill at 45 miles an hour, and I'm not even holding on to the handlebars, right? But if I don't get to the tipping point, and you can see if you apply performance metrics right here, you cancel everything before it gets to here. And when you cancel these projects, or you don't actually, they don't actually cancel them because nobody's that brave. What they do is they start to modify the funding, <clears throat> modify the hiring, take away the overlay sales force, whatever. And then the initiative just goes back to where it was. And, so, and that's, the, that's the, great, the great depression of working in established enterprises, is to watch the enterprise just time after time after time get almost to the tipping point and then fall back. And you just think, God, Dilbert was right, you know? And the reason I'm writing Escape Velocity is I don't think Dilbert is right. I think you can beat it. I think they can beat it. But they can't beat it by playing the, the, the same old game. So what I want to talk about tonight, the book is, or there's five chapters. The book's around organizing around this. I want to talk a little bit about this because I want to introduce this model about uh, uh, the alternative to crossing the chasm for, for, uh, for consumer markets. And then I'm going to close by talking about this category power and, and how I think large companies can solve for this, uh, whether you are going to be the whale or whether you're the thing inside the belly of the whale. In either case, I think, I think it will be of interest to you. And then we'll throw it open for grabs and we'll just talk about whatever we want. So um, execution power. So how do you get to scale? So this is about getting to a tipping point. Everybody here who has a startup, this is your goal. The tipping point is when your company becomes what accountants call a going concern. 
<laughs> so what does that mean, a going concern? A going concern is a company that is more likely to be in existence a year from now than not. Okay? Today, your company is less likely to be in business a year from now than not, right? And until you've reached the tipping point, that is the state. Even if you've got $10 million in funding with another $20 million coming. If you're not a going concern, and it, it does relate at some point to cash flow positive. It relates to the fact that I don't have to go begging for more money, et cetera, et cetera. So how do I get to the tipping point? And until you, and once you realize this in venture, you realize no other metric matters for venture. Doesn't matter. Any other, I mean, can they be clues? Should, of course. Do you measure? Sure. But at the end of the day, this is the deal. Okay, so the idea here is a pretty simple idea. It is okay if I'm on some arc of execution, you know, I'm going to invent something. At some point, I'm actually going to have something that's beyond alpha, maybe even into beta. You know, I'm going to start deploying this thing. I'm going to start growing this thing. And if this thing is really successful and it gets really deployed, some point somebody's going to worry about optimizing it. Probably not me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the entrepreneur. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to something else. But so there's these two arcs about scalability and, and, and profitability. And in the middle of this thing is, is a tipping point. And this is the tipping point that we care about, which is you, everybody in this room is somewhere, actually you're probably somewhere, you might even be down here, but, but, but you know, you're, we're, we're somewhere in here and we're, say, we're saying, okay, I would love to get to a point where the world is now pulling me forward. The difference between being here and there is here the world is still pushing back. And here, the world is pulling you forward. And it is a miraculous change when it happens to you. Uh, if you've been in a company that's ever gotten some success and some momentum, the quarter before, man, I mean, nobody returned your call. You're, you're pushing everything. You're trying to figure out some way to make it work. And the quarter after, it's like, oh my God, we're on allocation. You know, I can't get enough of this stuff. I, I, can't, I can't go forward. It happens over and over and again. And I want to talk about the chasm model and this other model in relation to a tipping point. But why tipping points? Pretty straightforward. This is the technology adoption life cycle. People do what other people what they see other people doing, particularly pragmatists. It leads to two phenomena, which are the two first books. The chasm, which is, I'm not going to sit in the front row if you're not sitting in the front row. I'm going to be, I'm going to be back by the pool table, right? I mean, when I used to teach freshman English, I mean, my God, you get anybody in the first three rows was like an amazing accomplishment. I'm not going to the front. Okay, that's the chasm, right? The tornado is when everybody's doing it, and now all of a sudden you think, I'm going to get left out if I don't do it. So we sometimes used to call it the junior high dance problem, you know, with boys on one side of the gym and girls on the other side of the gym, that kind of problem. So pre, pre and then at some moment, and it's, a ma and it's, it's absolutely mysterious as to how it happens, but it's like, boom, it goes from chasm to tornado. So pre-tipping point, no progress is sustainable. This is the problem of you're not a going concern. As soon as you withdraw the stimulus, the so you can buy business for, you know, you can try to stimulate, do stimulus. This is a little bit like the federal government in our economy. You can try stimulus, but when you draw the stimulus, it goes back to the old state. Uh, Post-tipping point, however, it's, there's a change in state. So it's actually another metaphor is state change. So think of state change as a metaphor for this thing that's happening in a market. So what you're trying to do as an entrepreneur is around a disruptive innovation. You're trying to bring the market to a, to, from its present state of resisting the new paradigm to some future state where it embraces it. Once it's embraced the new par paradigm, it will not, unless you completely barf all over everything, it will not, it will not go back to the prior state. But it, just before that, its tendency, even when it's almost there, is to go back, is to go back to the, to the, to the prior state. So this is where this this is the chasm model that, that you know that, that described this for B2B. So it said, look, if you introduce a disruptive innovation to any community, five, the community will self-segregate. By just you don't have to it, it'll do it by itself. The innovators will distinguish themselves from the early adopters, who will distinguish themselves from the early majority. We call them the pragmatists, then the conservatives, and finally the laggards. And each one of those represents a different strategy for dealing with disruption. So the innovators say, I, I, I think it's really cool. I'd like to see what it's about. The laggards think, I hate this stuff. It's an instrument of the devil, right? And these people in the middle are not so sure. The visionaries, though, believe going early is better than waiting around. You're going to maybe get some significant competitive advantage. The pragmatists are going, 
I'd be a lot more happy if I saw a bunch of people do it before me and the conservatives are going, well, I'm not going anytime soon, but eventually I guess I have to. So what we the big lesson we learned in the 90s was the first two groups secede and they create this thing we call the early market. And that is people who are predisposed to go early on in the first wave of innovation, either because they love the technology or they want the competitive advantage. Then we saw this thing called the chasm, and this is what we were missing in the early 90s. This is why we would open extra sales offices at about a time when, when we actually should have been being more careful. But, but what we didn't understand was the pragmatists are going, I'm not doing it until I see other people like me doing it, and that's not happening yet. Okay? Then the idea was if you could get some pragmatists to do it, probably it was initially in a niche market. We called these pragmatists in the bowling alley pragmatists in pain. And they, were, they had real problems and they're going, look, I hate new technology, but I hate the problem I have even worse. So if you can help me with this problem, I will embrace you. And if once they did embrace you, they embraced you wholeheartedly. The entire segment who had the problem would say, there is an answer, here's how it works. Everybody, everybody should, should do it and, it and it takes off immediately. And then if it gets more general, there's the tornado, which is, hey, you know what? This isn't just for these people or those people or this other group. This is for everybody. We should, oh, we should all have one. So cell phones for a while were for VCs, you know, and, 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 and for investment bankers. But today, I mean, honest to God, they're for five billion people on the planet, right? Uh, it's a complete horizontal thing. And then Main Street is, okay, it's now been, it's now been accepted. So that was the model, and if you look at the, that model, the metrics that we came out of were this. And the, if you're doing a B2B startup, you need to know this page cold. Okay? You, just, you cannot make mistakes on this page. So that says, if I have a disruptive innovation, my first goal in the early market is to get one or more flagship customers making a big bet commitment to me. That's not a crappy little customer. It's a big flagship customer. So tiny little customers are no, of no value prior to the chasm because they don't think of themselves as tiny. They think of themselves as your customer and they take as much time as a big customer, but they give you no return. In a, prior to the chasm, you need big, uh, big sort of name type customers to put your technology story on the map. Then you get into the chasm, okay, you, 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 you've, you've maybe had one or two big bets who completely derailed your entire R&D plan. Your, your roadmap is in a shambles because they said, well, I want your product, but I want the underwater version of your product. And you're going, sir, <laughs> it's a camera. Yes, I know, I need the underwater camera. Right. Okay, but I have a check for a million dollars. And so you well, okay, un underwater camera. Okay, 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 we can, we can. <laughs> so, but eventually you say, you know what, we can't do the underwater space camera with, uh, you know, whatever. So, but the pragmatists are still not hanging back. That's when you have to take the beachhead and that's when we do this whole chasm crossing exercise around finding the high pain use case, getting strong word of mouth support. That's what crossing the chasm was about. And in the bowling alley, it's just maybe additional segments you're bringing on one at a time around very use, use cases that are segment specific. What's cool about that is you can tackle this Mark, these two markets at any size. You can be a $2 million company and you can become a player in a niche market if you have something that's really unique to that market. And that market will grow you from two to 10 million. All, uh, Documentum went from two to eight to 25 to 45, largely based on the pharmaceutical market using their software for new drug approval applications. So one app, one segment. So it, it can happen, okay? The tornado is a different game. The tornado is when this, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Just to be clear, the flagship could be in context of a small niche. Yes, the key thing is within that niche, it's got to mean something. It's got to be the player. So the problem that you have often is when you're in the early market, anybody who will say hi to you is someone that you want to spend time with, right? And, and so the tendency is to end up with a customer who's very nice to you but is not is not worth worth gaining. Because you need you need what you really want to have happen here is you want other people to talk about you. They've never heard of you, but they've heard of Walmart, or they've heard of somebody like that, and, and, and whatever they're doing. Okay, the inside the tornado is when the app goes horizontal. This is where the huge fortunes in tech are made. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in relation to, to uh, Facebook in the next slide. And then Main Street is when we go back. Main Street is the end of secular growth and the beginning of cyclical growth. That, that, happens, that starts happening on Main Street. And once you're on Main Street, you, now, we're, now, we're, now it's cyclical growth. Maybe for decades, okay? Maybe for decades. But it's a different game. Now, most of the management theory that they teach in MBA stuff is exactly right. 
Okay, it's just it's just before, but and all the performance metrics are extremely useful. Okay, but 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 for this stuff, the performance metrics are are not very useful. Okay, if you're in a B2B startup, some of you are. Some of you were we were saying Citrix is, is doing, or Rob, you were saying uh, yeah, the accelerators. No, the, accel the accelerators, the Alchemist accelerator, that one. And the Citrix accelerator. And the Citrix, okay. They both have an enterprise focus. Okay, they both have an enterprise focus. Okay, this is this is this is kind of the the game plan for that. Um, that said, the, the, both accelerators also have this interest in, well, yeah, but what about B2C? Because there's a B2C component to a lot of the stuff that Citrix is doing. Even if Citrix itself isn't going to be a B2C brand that much, there's a B2B2C where the, where the B2C part is being affected by the first B is affecting the second B dealing with the C. That's pretty easy. But, but the th truth of the matter is in the last decade, it was just pure B2C. I mean, Google was B2C, Facebook's B2C, YouTube's B2C, OpenTable is B2C, Yelp is B2C, Zappos is B2C. All the cool companies from the, from the first decade of the century were B2C plays. None of them arguably crossed the chasm. I mean, I, 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 this is, I mean, it's kind of cute. I mean, I, I spend time with MBA classes, and the people are really sweet, you know, and they'll say, oh, yeah, Mr. Moore. Said, Crossing the Chasm, that was a great book. <laughs> I went, what, 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 oh, yeah, no, great book. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing great, and I'm going, no, no, go back to the verb, the verb, the verb, the verb, past tense, huh? What's up? So they said, well, you know, I mean, really, the Chasm, Google, uh, Facebook, Chasm, YouTube, 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 Chasm, we did what's the Chasm stuff? <laughs> so for a while, and you know, for a while, I said, "Well, no, wait a minute, blah, blah, blah." blah. I, I would sort of invent chasms, and all of a sudden, I thought, "You know what, Jeffrey? Just stop. You know, why don't you just shut up and learn?" So I started talking to these folks. Say, "Well, okay, so forget about chasms. What are you doing? And what what happened?" So I talked to entrepreneurs. Here's what they said: First of all, the entrepreneur in this model is a starter motor, and they're trying to get a bunch of gears spinning. And the first gear is. Was act and these are largely done on the web. So these are largely web-based businesses with a very low friction. So acquisition was a traffic problem. Could I just get people to come to my, and at that time it was my site. Now I realize that the site itself has become an archaic concept. But in the past decade, it was not an archaic concept. So the, the site, okay, could I get traffic? If I could get traffic, the next question was, could I engage the traffic? Could I get them, could I get them doing something? Could, could I get, you know, not just come, but come back and maybe stay for a while and do stuff. And then if I could engage them, could I monetize this? Okay, which a little bit better. You know, could, could I, you know was it, was it going to be through subscription? Was it going to be through advertising? Was it going to be through virtual goods? I mean, there were all these experiments, right? And then could I enlist them and what enlistment meant was could I if I could positively enlist them that meant they would help me acquire my next customer which means that the thing would start to go viral and that was a really critical dynamic in this model because what you realize fairly quickly is but, but with search engine uh, marketing and search engine optimization you could not afford to acquire all your traffic on your own dollar you just it was too expensive but could you get this to, and if you could then 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 you know we'll, we'll talk about the increasing returns if by the way you couldn't or worse if they start going backwards as like what happened with myspace now all of a sudden you get negative virality and that's a very frightening thing and it's, it, it's, it's ugly and it happens. So the model we played with said, okay, I'm the entrepreneur, what am I trying to do? What I'm trying to do is I'm running experiments. So I'm going to run an acquisition experiment. And now, by the way, I'm doing these all at the same time. I mean, I, it, it's serial here. But basically, I'm running monetization enlistment. If I could get the enlistment going, maybe I could get the acquisition going faster. Maybe, you know, get my engagement going a little bit. I'm trying to, like, get this thing spinning up, spinning up, spinning up, faster, faster, faster. faster. And it, what I'm trying to do is create a tornado, okay? <laughs> so the whole point about it was it was all about the tornado. There was no early market. There was no chasm. And there was no bowling alley. It was pure. Can I create a tornado virtually out of the spinning of the, the spinning of, of these gears? And when we looked at it, and we, you know, when you looked at Facebook and you looked at YouTube, you said, "I don't know how they did it." But what, here's what we. But, but we. But when you decomposed what happened, it decomposed well into those four things. And so what we began to look at those four things, and the first thing we realized is that. Two of these gears are very measurable 
Investors care a ton about them. Boards of directors, you know, want to want to say, well, how much traffic, how many hits, you know, how many uniques, blah blah blah, and then how much monetization are we getting out of it? And this is where all the attention was going. But the thing we realized is the other two gears we decided were the power gears, and that in fact, engagement and enlistment were better predictors of the future of this of this exercise than acquisition and monetization because you can juice these things in the short term. It's very hard to juice juice these two. So they're, they're very, they're very, uh, and if I had to spend time with this model, and I do, with more David Out companies, we spend a lot of time on how are you engaging, how, how, what are your metrics for engagement, you know, we'll, I'll show you some slides, the next slide on some metrics on this, and then uh, what, to what do, how, how, much, how much of the enlistment behavior are we getting here? And in the case of media, the monetization often is left off entirely until you've got an enormous media following. But for example, with e-commerce, you can't afford to do that. So an e-commerce model, you have to have monetization built in. So it depends on a little bit on the thing. But these were the four, these were the four metrics that we, we said. And we said, okay, acquisition, rate of gaining new users, engagement, length, depth, frequency of user engagement. And with the current big data stuff and the analytics, you can find out a whole lot about engagement. Monetization, pretty obvious. And then this issue around enlistment, can you get this viral thing going? And virality, by the way, Turns out that you know this thing called net promoter score. It's a very interesting question. It's, 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 I mean, it, it, in essence, it boils down to one question. You ask customers, how likely are you to refer a friend of yours to this company? And one to ten. And the the, the simple heuristic is, if people answer that from uh, with a ten or a nine. You have a net positive net promoter score, and they are going. You're, you're going to get experience virality. If they answer it seven to eight, it's going to come out about neutral. If it's six or below, it's a churn problem. Okay, they're going to actually negatively do it. So, so we, so we said, okay, that's fine. That's kind of interesting. And then we came up with this idea of so what we called slowest gear theory. So the idea behind this was, prior to the tornado. At any given point in time, one of those gears is going slower than the other three. And it's slowing the entire tornado effect down. So the, the priority for this quarter should be speed up that gear. And the actions required then were, OK, what's our slowest gear? Let's focus everyone on speeding it up. Maintain attention on the other three gears. Repeat every quarter until the tornado happens or you run out of gas. That's sort of the formula. Now, interestingly, the last time I talked about this at an incubator, I got challenged on it. Somebody said, wouldn't it be better to just pick your fastest gear and just spin the crap out of it, you know, and sort of hope it creates some sort of vacuum that would suck the other three gears in? <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things where you think, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> so I, I'm not convinced that this is the only way to play the gear. But the problem, that the, the reason why I like this model, even in its current state, whether this is the right end state or not, is it gives people in this, in this tornado creation mode something to think about every quarter. The problem that, that we were having in venture was we just didn't know. It was like, it was like Hopi rain dancing. You know? I mean, sometimes it rained. And sometimes it didn't. And was it like because he danced with the feathers on his feet, or you know, did he dance to the right instead of the left? I mean, we didn't know. And and, and, we, and so you have these incredibly irrational things. Now either you say, you know what, it is Hopi rain dancing, and just you know, it's like roulette. Just put your chips down and shut up, you know. And if it comes out, you know, double zero, and you are on double zero, you win. Um, but that didn't seem like a very pragmatic way of going about it. So this is what we were doing with it. And the reason I just wanted to share it with you is, I I, I do think. I think this is the right model for a B to C, and I think that the chasm model is the right model for B to B. So I just wanted to kind of frame that. With that in mind, either way, we're still trying to create a new company in a new category. And the question is just how do I get it to scale? Wh which way do I play? I think it's easier to cross the chasm than to do this. I think it's cheaper to do this. So this is not a very expensive experiment to run. Whereas crossing the chasm can be fairly expensive. But the probability of you getting to the other side with crossing the chasm, I think, is very high if you do it correctly. And I think the probability of this happening is very low. On the other hand, if it happens, we might experience a $25 billion devaluation. But at 75, it's still a lot of vacation homes for the valley. That's kind of where we're at.
Okay. By the way, I think the reason that Facebook got devalued is around this issue of mobile. Uh, because people are going, half your traffic now is on mobile. You don't have a clear way to monetize. You'll notice this week they announced, or last week, they're going to have a mobile device. So, what a surprise. I mean, so the, 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 they're not stupid. I mean, these, but, but the truth is, it's very scary to be solving a monetization problem of that magnitude in the public markets. You know, it, it's just like, but it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, well, the problem, it's, for, it, you know, it's, it probably, it, first of all, it's a miracle. What that company's accomplished is absolutely miraculous. It's a very powerful company under any circumstances. But the public market does not do well with categorical risk. And, the, the, and this, is a, this is a huge part of their monetization model that is just categorically at risk. Is that compounded by that Google, how do you see the problem with monetizing mobile in the real world? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Apple has clearly showed that you can monetize mobile. So the app store model works and the app device works. But advertising probably doesn't work, which is what makes it scary. What would you attribute the mean leap? I mean, obviously this isn't a surprise. <laughs> No mobile's there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, if I mean, I can't even get to the starting line to get to the chance to make this mistake. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm wired wrong. Um, so what? What? Well, so so I think I think what they were doing was, if, if I could attribute to, if it if it was in fact a mistake, which it feels like it kind of was, um, I would say it's a performance. They were looking at their performance metrics, their desktop. Monetization thing was is, has a terrific trajectory, and of course that that's sending a signal like we're just going to kick the crap out of everybody. Yahoo is, you know, will stamp under our feet, and Google's next, right? And and um, and then this creeping mobile mobile consumption just didn't it it didn't fit in any of the statistics very well. But my I was making enough money from one half of my business that I could just sort of sweep it under the rug. And I mean, literally, that thing about quality of earnings, it came out the week before the IPO. Yeah. Why couldn't they just look at the size of the real estate on the screen? Well, I mean, I mean that, course, that does seem a possibility, doesn't it? Uh, right, right, right. So, so I, 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 mean, I, I think everybody got the advertising. Now, people kept on hoping, and it probably I think people still keep on hoping that the advertising, there's some way to sort of tweak advertising to make it work. I. Th I guess there's some non-zero probability that that's true, but I don't think it's a very good one. Um, so, but, I, but if you're telling me, is there any way to monetize mobile engagement? Sure, there must be. It just probably isn't advertising. Is Spotify or Pandora a possibility? Yeah, but neither of those economic models are very good right now. They're both, they're both getting creamed right now. So, so is there a subscription, a subscription in the future? You know, who would have thought virtual goods ever would have worked, right? I mean, so, so I mean, it, it, there's still, I think, stuff. The one that seems obvious to work is some version of apps. That, that seems the most obvious. And if you, Facebook has their own phone, and if they make Facebook apps, which they're probably going to do, I mean, I think that's clearly one way. But that's not the economic model they went public on. They went public on an advertising media model, and and that's I think that's the, the that's the correction. Yeah. What if for a merger of these focus on Facebook credits, like mobile um, minutes, mobile, mobile Min currency, so just paying Facebook credits using your mobile phone? I mean, you just said they had to figure out. Yeah, yeah. Could they put a PayPal? Could they put a PayPal, a Facebook PayPal kind of thing in there? Yeah. I mean, will near, do we think? Does every? How many people think that at some point your smartphone will be your wallet? Yeah. I, I, yeah. We all say, of course. Now, in what decade? Well, I forgot. To, I looked into the future, but I forgot to look at the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I can't tell you which 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 day. But it, yeah. So so yeah. I I I think there. But the point about the public market and the valuation is, I'm sorry. I want the money now. And, and, and that's the part where I think they've kind of come a bit of a cropper. Okay? And then they did that weird thing at the last minute of adding 25%. I mean, it's like, oh, please. Just, it's like, well, they whispered a few things. Yeah, it, it don't grab from the, they, they felt a little bit like the large, a large trough of truffles in a set of people, <laughs> professional truffle finders around it. We, I won't call them pigs. They're more skilled than that.
trouble finding Bates are very skilled. Okay, all right, okay. I, let me just say, I, I want to close a little bit. Uh, actually, that, that was kind of fun, and maybe, maybe we had a quick by my head, but, but let me just close. I want to say a couple of things about this category power thing, because I want to put it in perspective, and also because we all do watch the public markets and begin to calibrate ourselves and our success from them. So this is the model that we've been talking about. This is the technology adoption life cycle. This is a time, this is the secular growth part of the curve, and then this is the cyclical growth part of the curve. And that thing can last for decades. And then there's this declining part. So this is what Sun was going through prior to being acquired by Oracle. And this is what Kodak went through. Okay. So, so, so and, and, and by the way, if you're running Kodak, you're not going to do any better than Antonio, right? I mean, it's just at some point, it's like bang. So, in looking at this thing, um, you know, you acquire power here, you utilize it there, and you tr try to get out of it. That, that seems pretty straightforward. And you'd like to the, what what, what uh, large companies are interested in doing is also acquiring companies like yours potentially to help them rejuvenate. But notice they don't go back to this side of the chasm. They want to rejuvenate on this side. They're willing to go back. Well, actually, the problem is they're not willing enough to go back to the bowling alley, but they should be. The, the way for a large company to rejuvenate is take next generation technology, probably let you guys develop it, get across the chasm, get a bowling pin going. That's still your job. Get a first, second bowling pin. Let somebody big acquire you and expose you to their sales force to take it through the tornado. That would be, that's kind of, that would be like the, the most virtuous interaction between the startup community and the established community. That would, be, that would be great, okay? Now, if you look at that from the point of view of, now I want, now I'm now, now going to change your job. You're now part of the executive team of a Fortune 500, of a Fortune 100 tech company. So you, you're running, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. So the, the previous slide is more for B2B? Because I see in the yeah. market, they don't wait for that They don't wait for which? That late to offer other companies. Well, it's, it's, so if you were like if you were like Condé Nast and you were trying to acquire a media property, again, I, I guess I mean maybe they acquire at some point in the tornado. Maybe because of the B two C model, you have to wait and acquire it actually in the tornado. See, but the problem we saw, I mean, even then, remember when Yahoo acquired Flickr? And man, they just, all the air went out of the Flickr balloon like in a, in a quarter. It's like, it was gone. And, and, and so, the, so there was something, uh, uh, you know, it's, you're, we're raising a really important issue, which is, which is can, in fact, can it, first of all, can an old media company acquire a new media company? And apparently not. I mean, is, is there a good example of any success? I mean, Fox, um, Rupert acquires MySpace. <clears throat> Thank you for playing. Uh, you, 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 okay, but yeah, but I would argue Google was a new media company itself. So it didn't, so, it, so I think that was actually spinning. I don't know, I don't know. So I, I, I do know in B2B this works. I think in B2B it will work, but you're right. Maybe with B2C it's like, I have to get acquired and I have to get acquired by a new media company. Unless I'm a failed startup, in which case I bluff an old media company into buying me <laughs> for a stupid amount of money because they're dumber than I am. Okay. <laughs> and I hope I don't go to hell. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that would be a, the other way to play it, I guess. Okay, let's see what happens. All right, so I, here's what, but I want to show you why this is more problematic. Because we sit here in this room and we think, you know what? We're really smarter than those guys. We're smarter than the guys at Microsoft. We're smarter than the guys at Cisco. We're smarter than the guys at Intel. Mm. No, you're not. No, we're not. We are not smarter than those guys. Now, they're making a, a, a mistake, but it's a, it's, a, it's a pervasive mistake about frameworks, so it's not that we are smarter than they are. Here's the problem they're trying to deal with. They're trying to have a portfolio which has high growth because that will show that they've got lots of power. At the same time, however, they have to create current earnings because that will show that they're making a lot of money. And so if you look at this portfolio, what it says is basically, High growth things that are not yet material revenues tend to be, live out here. What they're waiting for is for it to become material. This is, this is the promised land. This is when everybody's stock looks like I'm, we're all gifts to management. Then this is kind of where most of our business is going to live. And then this is like, oops, we better watch out for these guys. So when you look at large companies, this is what they look like. They've got a bunch of franchises, call them Windows, Office, you know, SharePoint, whatever. Call them the you know, x86 processor with no 
outliers or whatever. I mean, stuff like that. We've got a bunch of those. They've also got a ton of stuff going on here. Everybody's got labs. They've got a bunch of stuff there. They've got some old kind of decaying things. But the problem is there's nothing here. The board of directors is going, why don't we have more business here? And the answer is, well, here, what's going on? Here's what's happening. New business comes, great candidate, mm, didn't quite get there. It's okay, we got another one. Don't worry about it. We, we, There's not one trick pony. Okay, this guy's going to make it. Mm, not so much. Okay, so, but this guy's going to really make it, okay? And, and, and you say, what, what is going, why, why can't these things get from here to here? I mean, why did Xerox Park have to spin out after 20 years and say, we can't even be part of Xerox? Because we made every invention for 20 years that Silicon Valley capitalized on, and Xerox got none of them. Okay? What was happening? So that what we began to realize is it's a return on investment problem inside a large enterprise. So the key idea for understanding, if you work for a large enterprise, there are three horizons you need to understand about if you put money in, when do I get it back? Horizon one is... I put in money this year, I get it back this year. I, I hire more salespeople, I get more revenue, okay? It's obvious that big companies do that very well. The third, the, the horizon three is the opposite. I put money in now, I'm kind of hoping in five years now we're going to be in a great business. Don't know, sure as hell not going to make any money this year or probably next year. You know what? We always said big companies are bad at this. Not true. Big companies are fabulous at doing this. They all have great labs. They all invent cool stuff. That is not the problem. The problem is when I'm trying to put money in this year, but I won't get it back until next year or the year after. And I need to actually use key resources that Horizon One wants in this time period. This is where it gets really stuck. And so what happens is the Horizon 2 challenge is you're giving the whale indigestion. That's the problem statement. Because you're diluting the current fiscal year's performance. Now remember, everybody's on a performance compensation system. Every one of these people, their, their stock options, their bonuses, it's all about making the current fiscal year's per performance parameters. And to do that, you know, they, they have scarce valuable resources and you want to use those resources. You're going to produce very little revenue, with typically with negative cash flow. That's problem number one. Problem number two is you're a complete distraction. I'm trying to keep my sales force and my, my field force focused on, you know, the current business and making sure that things are working. You guys are totally unaligned with those. My customer base, by the way, is becoming increasingly conservative. You look like the radical fringe. You scare the hell out of my customers, so I don't like that. And by the way, you're not quite sure what you're doing because you're making it up every quarter. And, you know, it's like, God, I can't live with this. And, and, and by the way, you want my A players. And it's like, I'm sorry. I need my A players, okay? So, so it's like, don't do this to me, right? But we do. And so the interesting realization was we always thought the problem was there wasn't enough innovation in these companies. It is not true. There's plenty of innovation. The problem is you can't get it to market. You can't get it to market because the performance contract says... I will not share with you the resources that you need to get to market. This is why venture beats big companies every time in this game. But what it means is we, have, we don't have an incubation funnel. We have an incubation hourglass. And we can, we can invent as much crap as we want up here and do. And we can run as many businesses as we can get into down here, and we do. And we get nothing from here to here. That, that's the problem statement. So this is where, and I've got just two slides and I'm done. Um, this is where I've been spending my time for the last 18 months. Yeah. So what about like pre or Amazon that arguably seems to have avoided it? So Amazon, well, so the, 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 the cases you'd say is, I'm not sure 3M had that many disruptive innovations, so I'm not sure. This is this is for a disrupt. They were able to launch new products. New product. Yeah, they are, but but it's interesting. If the new product is not disruptive to this, to, if, if the new product kind of fits in with the old business, you can generate lots of new product and the system will work fine. It'll treat it kind of like recycling it kind of within Horizon 1. When it's a genuine, like Post-it Notes was a genuinely weird one. Uh, but by the way, the, the welding, part, part, no, I mean, okay, all right, okay. Well then maybe I need to study it more. Yes. Okay, I will, 3M. Uh, so, so, good. I will give you, I'll give you the, state, st the statement though for Apple. Apple did it three times in a decade, which is, like a black swan with purple tennis shoes and green eye shades, okay? It's, it's, it's unprecedented. And, and Amazon, to, to the point, your first name is? 
Sean. Sean. So Sean's point is they did it once. Now I think the interesting thing, and, and Oracle arguably through a very different mechanism, the interesting thing about Apple, Oracle, and Amazon is three founder-led companies. And I think I think part of this, as you're going to see in this next slide, which is kind of the five, the how, do you, how do you do this, it really does help if you have the cred of a founder to just sort of say, you know what, kind of my way or the highway sort of thing. It's very hard for a hired CEO to do this because inevitably the promise the hired CEO made was I'm going to improve shareholder value. <laughs> and, and this is, this will, I, I, that, I'll, I'll quit with this slide. Um, the first thing is when you plan and budget these things, understand you're going to make a grab for scarce resources. So you cannot do it during your annual planning quarter because at that time Everybody kind of sees the, the new performance metrics for next year, and they immediately become, and it's a zero-sum battle for stuff. So if you're going to do this, you have to do it the quarter before. Uh, it's, it, typically, most large companies do start their planning process in third quarter, finish it in the fourth quarter. Then the first quarter, they're launching the plan. So it's the second quarter is the only quarter you can actually resource these, these uh, things. And what you have to do is say, look, how much can we afford to spend on Horizon 2 total? And if the answer is not very much, then why are we in Horizon 3? Because if we're never going to get anything out of Horizon 3, why are we doing this, right? Corporate entertainment. Okay. So, so, so if it's corporate entertainment, fine, but just make, it's just, it's just, you know, do it mostly in PowerPoint, right? Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's good to be entertained. But, you know, have a few cute demos, but stop. But if you're actually going to bring it on, you have to at some point say, well, I guess we have to at least get one of them through. What most companies do, though, is, well, I'll get to it in another one. So the first thing, though, is if I'm going to do it, I've got to, Ring fence the resources the quarter before the knives come out to say, I need mine. And everybody's got to be bu buy into this thing of, okay, we're going to fund this thing. But obviously you can't fund very many of them, right? Which is not what people normally do. People normally fund lots of them, okay? The second thing is it has to be organized like a venture-backed startup, meaning no shared resources with the rest of the company. For, 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 because what will happen is if you share the sales force, if you share marketing, if you share engineering, if you share tech support, what will happen is the Horizon One business will say, you can have the resource, but not this week. This week we've got a major, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, this is, this is our number, we're hanging by a thread here, guys. You can't have them. And the problem is, I don't need them next week. I need them by 2 o'clock. Right? Because, and that's why, again, venture back things win because they have this integrated BU where there's some entrepreneurial you know, CEO, general manager kind of person who has direct control of all the functions, and people get on planes at 2 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon to go someplace. And that's what makes it work because you're making it up as you go along and you can't wait. Every day that you delay is a very, very bad day. And, and so that, that's the second idea. Uh, now, the problem is... If you have, if you keep on keep the BU in place for too long, you'll end up with this company that has an impossible overhead structure. So the deal is, once you pass the tipping point, the business does have to go back into the functional structure of the large corporation. So take Cisco, for example. It's got a sales force. It's got engineering. It's got professional support. When you're in this in this Horizon 2 phase, you cannot use the existing functions. You must have all those resources given into the control of the GM. But once you pass the tipping point, you then got to dissolve your, your company back into the greater thing. But it's big enough now to survive. You've gotten through the belly of the whale is essentially the idea there. The third, and the third one is use tipping point metrics, not performance metrics. I talked to you about that. But all the operating ratios are wrong. Inevitably what happens late in the game is the CFO looks at your sales force and says, we can't afford to have this overlay sales force. It's, I mean, look, I mean, by the way, you know, you're, you're growing from, from $200 million to $400 million, but, but this is a $30 billion company, so you're really not quite on the radar. But, but you're sucking resource, and, and the CFO is looking, uh, looking at his operating ratio saying, I'm going to miss my performance bonus because we're not hitting our operating ratios because of you with your overlay sales force, and we can't afford that anymore. And by the way, I point to the vice president of sales, and you're not going to get your bonus either. Right? So, I mean, so, so all of a sudden, we start pulling it back, and the problem is, man, we, didn't, we weren't across the tipping point. We weren't across the tipping point. That's number three. Four is 
uh, this issue of, of talent and compensation. So the idea is to get talent, you have a lot of variable comp, that's a very, that's a very venture idea, tipping point success. This is the one that's weird. My belief is the only way you're going to get this thing across to material size is if every direct report to the CEO has half or more of their variable comp depending on the outcome of this one initiative, period. Which sounds really weird, like, well, wait a minute, this, this, this is in the Division 3. I'm the general manager of Division 2. We don't even make this product. We have a completely different customer base. What do you mean? And the answer is, no, I meant what I said. That initiative in Division 3, half of your comp for the next three years depends on it getting to the tipping point. Well, that's not fair. Well, I, true, but, 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 I, but it's, the, it's the deal. If you do that, the, the, the people say, well, that's crazy. And then you say, well, just hang on, one question. If you really accepted the truth of that statement, do you think you could affect the outcome in that division? Well, no, I'm in another division. I know, but you don't share any customers with that division? You don't have any leads that they could use? You don't have any supplier relationships that might help? You don't have any key people that you might be able to throw into the game at a key moment? And all of a sudden you realize, you know what? If any, you could pick almost any initiative in any corporation and drive it to success if you had every single executive in that corporation saying, this is the win. And that's effectively what Jobs did at Apple. And he did them one at a time. That's the last thing. You do them, you do them one at a time. I don't care if you're IBM or if you're HP and you're a $120 billion corporation, you could afford to do one and only one at a time. You can have lots of them in Horizon 3 right in the queue, but my belief is you can only get one through the queue at a time. And, 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 and the game's got to be, that's why I want to have this, this compensation thing tied to this thing. And that's not what people do. People say, well, it's high risk, it's a low probability, we have to have three, four, five of these things, one of these things might win. It's like, no chance. We got three or four or five into this thing, the Horizon One organization says, okay, this is a joke. I mean, I, I will play lip service to as many as you want to give me. Yes, we will, quote, sell them. And by the way, if you want to screw around with my comp program, which says, if you don't sell 10 of these, you don't go to club, I'll sell 10 of these. You watch. You know, but you find the, I mean, basically, I, I would go to a customer and I'll say, would you please buy this? I don't care. Just buy it and I'll give you, what, what do you want? You want a router? Okay, I'll give you a router. Okay, you two switches? Yes, two switches. Okay. Uh, what, what, I mean, the point is, whatever it takes, it'll get done. So it's, it, you could, but if you had one, and only one, and by the way, that's what Jobs did. The iPod was all the way through. The music industry had been completely set on its ear before the iPhone was released. And the iPhone, he could have done it earlier. I mean, he had this thing going on with Motorola, what, three years before, called Rocker? I mean, he, he could have, and then the iPad he had before the iPhone. But he did them one at a time. Because he built, he built the entire thing, he kept the entire, and by the way, when you were doing the iPod, the Mac was like, who's ever heard of a Macintosh? It was all about the iPod. And then it was all about the iPhone, and who, who talked about the iPod recently? Nobody, right? And now it's all about the iPad. It's the iPhone and iPad are kind of sharing the limelight, right? iPod, never heard of it. So, so the, the point is, we've got, it takes that kind of focus uh, uh, to get through. So anyway, those were the, those are real, I think that's the, yeah, that's the, that's the last slide I want to do. Well, no, it could be my lack of clarity or bullshit. On the one hand, you're saying the last point, one at a time, no matter how big you are. Yes. Okay? And on the other hand, uh, did I hear you say that also, in, in when you go to Horizon, you have to have a lot of options? No, what you, if, or the idea is you can have as many Horizon 3 candidates. Think of this as like an, the, the, the metered on-ramp onto the freeway. So I can, have his, I can have a bunch of people in the pool in Horizon 3, and I can keep those guys kind of flying. Maybe it's like flying, trying to land airplanes, right? You know, they're flying around the airport. You can have a lot in the sky at the same time. And once you, they get through to Horizon 1, Corporations can run many different businesses at scale. GE's run, you know, many, many large businesses at scale. IBM has run many large businesses at scale. But the claim is, and this is a very radical claim, is nobody gets two through that pipe at the same time. That's the claim. Now, uh, Sean's point about 3M, I gotta go study 3M to make sure that I could be lying. I mean, my lips are moving, so it's possible that I'm lying. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but that's, at least in tech, that, that's what we've seen. And we've seen, I mean, think about it. Every year Intel has had multiple initiatives for Horizon 
three to go to Horizon One. Every year Microsoft has had them. Every year HP has had them. I mean, if these are our best companies, for, and it's not working. Whatever we're doing right now, it's not working. And, and, and then we've had these magnificent successes. So we're trying to cobble together a pattern where we might say, you know what, we need to, we need to make this work. At least that's, that's where I'm from. Yes? Could you give some examples of these initiatives you, you talked about earlier that you know, a large corporation will kind of get onto the ramp but you know, always pull back? Can yeah. you use some examples of initiatives like that? And Jim, we need to repeat the question. Again. Yeah, okay, okay. So the question is examples of large corporations who sort of get onto this roadmap, they get to a certain point, and then it's like, ooh, they kind of fall back. Well, I mean, I, the problem is I don't want to pick on anybody, right? Uh, but, but, but you... Any from Citrix? Uh, well, okay, so, well, so well, how about Citrix? <laughs> Is there an example where Citrix, this was going to be the great the great hope and it was going to go forward and then at some point it just went and it kind of fell backwards? Yeah, I think, so, so, so Citrix is built up. Yeah, 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 please, please. Just, just to hit it, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, oh, okay. Well, the, the, the one example that I'd, I'd raise there would be early on for Citrix we made one acquisition that was in the space of uh, portals. And it was at a point when everyone was so enthusiastic about them and we were still learning how to bring in acquisitions and how to grow. And so it was a really nice one where we, we brought it in, it was to be the new flavour of the moment and then it, it really faded out. Now happily since then we've learned how to do these. And so, so since that time, probably really over the last 10 years, we've had a lot of really good successes. Bring them in. And, and by the way, you yeah. saw your, your stock price, I think, in, the, in this decade actually apparently reflects some of that. Oh, very much so. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. But, uh, but I, 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 I think we should think of, of more examples. I mean, uh, my problem is that my examples are too old, but I mean, there was... Go ahead, Sean. Oh, the flip. The flip. Yeah, okay. So there was a situation where Cisco wanted to bring in a thing and... And they're a complex systems company, and Flip was a consumer, they were an enterprise company, it was a consumer product. That happens a lot, by the way, when you have a consumer company acquire a, a uh, enterprise company or vice versa, or a high volume company acquire a complex systems company. Compaq acquiring digital, that was pretty pretty painful as an example. But, but, but I like it with more with innovations that we, well, Xerox Park just missed, missed you know, the, the Mac, they missed. They missed. How about uh, Novell with uh, their uh, um, uh, suite set? Yes. They owned, uh, the, the, whole, the, whole, the, whole, the whole office automation suite with WordPerfect and, 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 and uh, yes, that would be one. That would be one. Didn't, it, it, HP, it, it, HP, oh. That, that that just even that didn't get to the starting line. That was, that was, that one was one like it's just. And, and by the way, that, that's kind of okay sometimes. I mean, it, it'll look look. Not everything's gonna gonna win, but the ones that really kill you are the ones which are. This is the next big. Well, Lotus Notes was an interesting one for Lotus. I mean, they 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 got to a point where they had to get bought by IBM because they just could not get it to the tipping point. I'm not sure it ever got there, but it, but yeah, it, yes, it did. Yes, it did. It did. It did. Yeah. Can it also just be the timing? In general, like when the Newton first came out, I used to work at Apple, and, and it was funny because people were making fun of the Doonesbury comics, saying, "Oh, we can't recognize his handwriting." And actually, that wasn't the main point about it. But people took that one thing, blew right. it out of proportion, right. and thinking, "Oh, this is never going to fly." And right. now you see a reincarnation of that with the iPad, and and it's it's just that the timing was off, or the way they marketed it was strange. Well, or the pub. Uh, and I'll just read yeah, the, okay. the, right. so the question was, was, could it just be timing, or is is it, could the timing be off? And the example was with the Newton and how everybody was poking fun of it that, then and now everybody's sort of reincarnating it. Right, right. Well, the Newton really was pretty clunky. And the iPad, the thing that you got to realize about the iPad and the iPhone is just how incredibly transformative it was to just touch the device. I mean, it was, I mean, we're now taking that for granted. We now watch little kids go like this, you know, like they're one and a half years old and they go like this, on a magazine. And like, What's the matter with this magazine? It doesn't work. <laughs> so, so we're completely rearranging our neurons there. But I mean, that was magical. I mean, think about how many, Palm, I mean, Palm was tried to get close to it. Um, you know, it, 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 it was hard to do. Yeah. yeah. Actually, can I just, I just yeah. want to tease in on that, because I think the market timing question is a, is a really good one. It is. And it, it's, I think, the biggest unknown for venture capitalists, and it goes to a lot of the issues on the tip point. I was on the board with an 
MDV funded company called Tiny Pictures. Yes. Which was a photo sharing social network yes. before Instagram. Yes. And it was sort of the most prominent photo sharing network at that time. Yes. In fact, we actually even did like a, I think a session with you. Yes. Um, and at that time, it was it was so hard to have predicted the phenomenon that was going to become Instagram, which really happened maybe within two years yeah. after that company yeah. got put yeah. out, yeah. after the company got acquired. Yep. How you know you said before about focusing on not on operational metrics but tipping point metrics. Is there anything tangible that you can provide in terms of how you think about market timing and when something's ripe to explode? I, I honestly think no. I, I honestly think you just try it and it either works or it doesn't. I mean, the thing about that gear model is there's no predicting when those gears tornado. At least I don't think there is. So, so, so in retrospect, you know, it, it's, it's really easy to see a tipping point after it happens. Yeah. You know, so that was a tipping point. Very good. You should have gone for that tipping point. Well, I didn't see it because it was in the future, not in the past. Uh, so, so, uh, but, but I, I, I mean, I think people who are probably better at it have a sense of how close are we to this transformative experience? But, but. You, I, my thing is, would I have made the tiny pictures but again? Yes, I would. Would you? Yes, because because it might have been the right time. So then if you're doing the H2, where you're doing one H2 investment, and you really can't predict, there's no right. way to prognosticate. You right. can have fantastic diagnostic right. tools, but right. none of them really right. help prog right. to prognosticate. How would you play that? How do you play that, and how do you just choose one, then, if, if, yeah. if, if there's yeah. complete uncertainty? Uh, so, I, so, so, I, so I'm back to crossing the chasm and thinking, I, and now I'm wondering if this is primarily a B2B model. Yeah. Because because in the B2B model, there's much less uncertainty about being able to drive through Horizon 2. I think in a B2C world, man, I guess you still just you'd have to buy one that was much further into the tornado, like YouTube, like Google buying YouTube. And then you just have to make sure that you gave it a lot a lot of cash to make sure that it didn't fall back. And what about all the founder-based companies that actually succeeded? It felt like there's something, some gut instinct yeah. involved. Yeah. But the, the, thing, the thing is, the issue is, 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 the thing I wonder about is how many succeed twice. I mean, so if you succeed, you must be wonderful, right? Well, what if it was a random event and you won the lottery? So I like you a really good lottery ticket buyer. Did you have the right numbers and I didn't have the right numbers? Or was it a random event? Um, I mean, I think that I don't think it's random. I think you have a sense that there are people that have a taste and a gift for it. But at the margin, I think the B to C successes are based on hits. So let's look at this. What hits business do we know about? Movies and, 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 and music. What executive has been able to live two decades in a row in charge of either movies or, 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 or records? Answer, none. All the great, brilliant executives who take three or four programs to the top are routinely pilloried as the idiots of the next generation because it's a hits business. I don't think you can predict hits. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but, but you know. Okay. Prosaic man. Yeah, we'll go back there. Okay. So the question of timing, I mean, you mentioned what iPhone, uh, iPad, and iPod. iPod, yeah. And then you said, I think, uh, Ravi. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Genius top of the Newton. Yeah. yeah. So those those first three products, the iPod wasn't the first music player. The iPhone wasn't the first touchscreen phone. The iPad wasn't the first tablet. You could argue that they were the first to be done right in those categories. Whereas I don't know how many Newtons more, failed more at the so. time when the when the actual moon came out, or like how popular the concept was. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say timing would have to do with so how many failed? Go ahead. Yeah, you so the question was, yeah. all these phenomenal um, successes that seem like they're first generation markets had predecessors that failed. Right. So how do you reconcile that? Right. It's, it's, were, the pre were the predecessors failures because of timing? Were the predecessors failures because of something else? I, I, I think... Well, I don't, so I don't think so. No touch screen. Well, there was... But I, I, so the question is, was it technology? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that it, that... that that the technologies, that it wasn't that Apple had the technologies first. I think if you look at those four power gears, nobody has engaged the way Steve's products engaged. I mean, at a level that was just like cosmically different. And that drove a kind of an enlistment that, I mean, people lining up in front of a store the night before, I mean, to get a white one? 
I mean, that's the only difference. <laughs> but Jeff, is, there, is there anything predictive that you could have said, you can, that a priori where you would have known that that device would have done that versus the Newton at the time? My problem is every time Steve ever showed me anything, I thought he was nuts. I mean, I'm so bad at this. I'm such the wrong person. Uh, I, I, I really, I mean, it's, I, hate, I hated every Beatles album the first time I heard it. And I mean, it was like, no. no. Eventually, I get my head around things, but I'm really the wrong guy. I'm, I, I really am. And so, so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You'll be perfect. And it's score. It'll be, yeah, yeah, yes, that'll work. That'll work. Um, we're going to go to Sujay, and then we'll go there. So, uh, so when there's a disruptive innovation, it is better to uh, not be the kind of uh, complete uh, leader in terms of the concept, but to see the near failures and then uh, line up the ducks properly. Yeah, so the question is, for disruptive innovation, right. is it better to be the trailblazer, or does the trailblazer take arrows in their back, and is it better just okay. to be the fast follower? Yeah, and, and, and identify and, where the arrows yeah, went, and right, then right. do the iTunes before you do the... Right. Yeah. I, I think B2B is very different than B2C. In B2B, I think you want to be the trailblazer. I think the advantage is the first mover in B2B. Um, because because I think you can control your way across the chasm. Now, you can still get it stolen from you on the other side. Somebody can take can take it away from you before you get into the tornado. But I think it's still the best way. With B2C, I think what we're saying here, see, to me, I just, I, I'm still on the, stuck on this metaphor that it's a hits business and there's, there's a degree of randomness to it, which, there are obviously people that have better taste in music than others, people that are better at picking good bands than others. And so I think that probably makes sense. But, 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 you, still, but you, you think the Apple innovations are B2C? Yes, and I think Apple absolutely. You subscribe to the one H2 innovation. Yeah, I know. The, 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 I mean, as I'm listening to you going, well, but the fact of the matter is what he did was he drove those things one at a time because he had to get his entire company behind it. And it was, and it was a big bet. And Huge you're bet. You're saying there's nothing a priori we could have predicted if that was going to be. A that is correct. So that was a bad management decision according to the Harvard Business School. But it was a phenomenal one in terms of capitalism. Because it worked. Yeah. And and this is like the, but the this, takeaway. But the, the takeaway. This is like this is novel Shogun where I don't know if you if you ever read Shogun or seen Shogun. Okay, a couple of people. Well, anyway, it is, it's it's Japanese. It's this this Japanese story of 16th century Englishman lands there and a whole bunch of stuff happens. But he's having a discussion with a Japanese warlord. And the Japanese are very clear about about what's proper and what's improper. What's and if it's improper, that means you're going to have to be killed. So so he says the the, he, uh, the, the Englishman says you should revolt, and, and and the Japanese warlord says you can never revolt against your liege lord. He says unless you win. <laughs> so that, that, that I mean he did he won and, and I mean but that's why I say it's a black swan with purple tennis shoes. But that was three bet your company bets that. The odds against all of them were astronomical, and he just did it. He did it. And it's hard to prognosticate. Yeah, okay. It, it, yeah. Okay, um, Tom? So you talked about, uh, you gave a lot of weight on timing, but uh, we know what those three products and how important it was. But uh, how important is it that those three products in the Apple example would be complementary to each other to keep the whale swimming and fed well? So the question is how important is for the H2s to be complementary? <coughs> What's interesting about them is, I, I mean, on the supply chain, I'm sure there was a lot. But if you think about them, those are four different markets that are not very correlated. So the iPod really didn't correlate with the Mac. I mean, I mean eventually it all came together in the Apple Store. And, and the iPhone really didn't have much to do with the music and the, and the iTunes. So he could have conceivably made the iTunes Store the App Store, but he didn't. So that was a whole new ecosystem. Now, it is pretty clear that iPad looks a lot like... Remember there was a thing called iTouch? It was, it was like an iPhone that wasn't a phone. Yeah, I think that was sort of like a toy iPad kind of thing. But the, the app store, but even there, you, you're feeling like the apps now for the iPhone apps and iPad apps, that's the closest one. But what's weird now is that once the success is going, now Macintoshes are the new de facto standard. I mean, if you, I mean honest to God, if you, you, you feel like, oh my God, I still have a Windows machine. I've, I've got it. Well, thank God you don't. Uh, <laughs> how about I'm looking around? Anybody got one of those things called, this one by a company called Microsoft? Okay, I still have one. But, yeah, Nathan. I might have the last one. Okay. Um, but, um, this and then, just show me here, too. I'm yeah, sorry. Five minutes, the original question, if I understood it properly, about uh, the trend and, and what you think is going to tip. We've yep. been talking B to B yep. and, and B to C. What yep. if we flip that around? What's was my intent for asking this question. What if it was C to B, customer-centric? Uh, that's 
a movement. Do you see that? What, what's your thought about that? Thing? It would still have to, it would still. The question, what's, yes. the, what's your thought about the tipping point for C to B or intent casting? Right, so intent casting is this notion of instead of the vendor going this way, the consumer would broadcast their purchase intent or their interest intent, and we would reorganize the economy around that. I guess the point would be think about how many different business processes would have to be re engineered for that to work. And I think what you would come to the conclusion is I can't do it globally at scale from the beginning because it'll it'll break. And so this question, you and I were having this conversation, well how could you reduce reduce the the, the environment in which you could make it happen once? And we actually got to a very interesting place which you, which I don't know how much how public you're being with your ideas. So, okay. Well so we got the interesting place of, of could you actually make a high rise office building a unit of activity because it's an interesting demographic, it's got interesting ideas. There are ways you could you could exercise it. That's the kind of thing you'd have to do. You you try to get you try to get it going, and you, again, you'd be running these experiments around, can I acquire people in that building? Can I engage them? Can I monetize them? Can I enlist them? Can I get them to get other, can they help me get to the next building? I'm kind of going forward. At some point in the B2C model and the, and the C to B model, you have to have viral success or it doesn't work. And, 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 and so, and that to me is still magical. That's the part where, where you probably need a more competent person up here right now, because I, I can feel like I'm, I'm okay on it. Mean, I think there's some ideas that I've been sharing with you about B2C that are important, but man, I don't have anywhere near the confidence in them I have in my B2B model, for sure. For yeah, sure. But the first step is, is, is knowing what you don't know and then figuring it out. Yeah, um, who did you want to go to? Mark? Right here, yeah. Mark. So if you take the original app, the early Apple TV is, is not a huge success. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in? I mean, is, is that, was he just, you know, he even, Steve said it was a hobby. Well, I did, that's a point. I did, that would be an the example. Is, if you take the okay, Apple sorry. TV as, as not a success, where does that fit? And my question is really then, how did the, if, if you can only do one at a time, and where does that mean? Well, basically, well, basically, I think that might be an evidence for my point, which is you can't do two at a time, and Apple TV got basically marginalized. But how come the other one didn't fail then? I mean, how come? Well, that's, that's a good question. A good question. It should, it should have. It should have by, by the reasoning that I just gave you. Um, my sense was he just was relentlessly driving the ones that made it. I mean, in a way that, I mean, think about going after, well, anyway, the, 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 had, had his complete attention. Okay, who hasn't asked a question? Yeah. Um, we'll go for Ethan and then Jimmy. Okay. Yeah. One thing that n neither one of your models seems to address is peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. And, and from where I'm sitting, kind of looking at a lot of the innovations in tech, a lot of the hottest startups right now are all peer to peer. Yeah. It's like you can, you know, share. You can have, find people to share their homes. You can find people to share work with crowdsourcing. You can find people to share um, their cars. Everything is like now being like these peer to peer marketplaces. And almost every vertical that we saw, companies traditionally providing the service in the past. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's also one of the hardest things to get going because it's dependent on the chicken and the egg, right? Right. And so, which of your models? Well, I think that's a gear. I think the question. So, what do okay. you so talk about peer to peer? And which of your models apply? Because there's an inherent chicken and egg in terms of getting that, right. getting that flywheel rolling. Right. And yet, it's where there's been huge phenomenal successes. Well, I'm not so sure there's been huge phenomenal successes. There's an enormous amount of energy, and there's clearly a bunch of social interest and excitement around it. Um, because I, I think peer-to-peer -peer in general is still a work in progress. But I think it's the gear. I mean, I, I think you would start with the gears model. You may have to say, look, Jeff, you're missing a gear or there's something going on. But if you think about it, well, let's just suppose we wanted to start, somebody was, somebody's doing a peer-to-peer B&B, Airbnb, who is kayak for Airbnb, who, who said that to me? Okay, trip, okay, okay. Uh, tripping.com, okay, so tripping.com. So, so the point is you say, okay, okay, well, it's pretty easy if two people are sitting together in a car and saying, I got an idea, you could stay at my place and I could stay at your place. But, but, but how do we get two to four to eight, to, to how do we start to scale that? So there's an acquisition issue of just getting, just getting people to even awareness of it, if you will. But I think there's this engagement thing of, is there some way I can do trials? Or it's a little bit like that consumer thing about awareness trial, you know, uh, going forward. But can I get engagement? Is there a monetization model here at all, or is this just actually a social movement? And, and in which case, it's a nonprofit movement, or it's, or at least. Or, or I'm not going to worry about monetization, but can I get an enlistment going where people say, you got to understand, if you're going to go to New Zealand, you got to do this Airbnb thing or whatever trip. 
Tripping, tripping, tripping.com. Tripping? Tripping.com. Tripping.com. Tripping. Tripping. You got to use tripping.com. This is, you can stay for free, man. It's cool. And they usually leave cookies out. Uh, yeah, uh, but, you, but, you, but you'd want to get, you, I, think it's, I think it's those four gears. And I, I don't know that, I, I can't think off the top of my head of a fifth gear to add to the problem. So, so for example, right now, if you could pick one gear, I, I'll either give you a magic card to improve acquisition, engagement, monetization, or enlistment. And which one would you want to improve this quarter? Classify. Classify. <laughs> okay. But I think that but the, the, the phenomena that I think Ethan is talking to and that Gertz probably experiences is that these, these markets are really hard to start. Yes. And then there's nonlinear growth yes. that they take off. Yes. And yet the model feels like it's sort of a, more of a linear analytical approach to try to solve that. that. Okay. Does that Does that model, is that the right way to think about these phenomena in, in, terms, of, in terms of making that? Actionable. I do think it is non. I mean, the, my attempt of having the gears spin faster and faster and faster was a little bit to attempt to induce an image of nonlinearity because I don't think it's push tab A into slot B get result C. I think B to B is more like that. Yeah. But but even there, there's some of that. But in this one, yeah, it just feels like and then a miracle happens. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. but it does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, let me we go probably have more to talk G, about. Let me go behind you first. Yeah, I mean, this is something we talked about before, but um, just talking more about, again, the whole Apple success with the different products. And this is just something that has been talked about, but just the whole idea of pop culture and how much that really affected. And I know when the initial iPhone came out, um, and even the iPods, you know, social platforms weren't as popular as they are today as a way for something to go viral. But the, mo the mobile aspect was that, you know, someone who was cool had their iPhone with yes. them, and you saw it as yes. someone who wants to be accepted in society, just a lot of psychological um, and yes. things that are embedded within us. Yes. So what's the those things versus the Apple TV. And is there a question? No. Or is it no, it's a good No, but, but, but so let me turn it into a question. So that we just kind of rehearsed, you know, how the Apple thing worked. It was pre-social, it was pre-social pre uh, viral. But you were, but uh, it's an Ash... Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. Andrea was talking about how contagious it was. Right. And that's the key thing. That, so that to me is the enlistment gear. That The thing was amazing about it. People would pull out a Blackberry and they go like this. And you say, what are you doing? Practicing, you know, because <laughs> I'm going to get one of these things, right? And, and, and so, so the enlistment thing really worked, and the engagement thing was it was really engaging, and it really did enlist. And the monetization, I mean, the cost of fortune, and the Apple Store was a very interesting uh, venue for at least the early adopters to do uh, to do acquisition. So, if you think about it. There was something on each of those four gears that was kind of amazing. Whereas if you think about taking that same product and putting it into Best Buy, yeah, it doesn't fit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that the, that the slowest gear thing has some merit, hmm. some merit to that. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, uh, yeah. Can Great. Just, and then there's somebody in the back as well. Kinsey was saying for the Apple part, I think it's not just having like an iPod, an iPhone, an iPad. I think it's, Steve was setting up the entire infrastructure to say, look, you know, Oh, a phone is just a phone, but look, you can now listen to music on that phone. And oh, by the way, Mr. Developer or whoever, you can actually put your app on our little platform for a store, and people would actually pay 99 cents to download this, that, and the other thing. Some of them are free, great, but you can also, you know, make money on it. Yeah. So you, so you, you see, great, wait, so you see Glee on, you know, yeah, 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 Fox, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Said, download it. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And so what I'm saying is that it's not just separate little products, but he tied them together right, right. into an infrastructure or ecosystem, ecosystem that showed that enough people could make money on it or enough people could have things go viral on it. Yeah. And that, I and think, he is created, success. Yeah, and this is an interesting point. So Gene was talking about how it was more than just introducing products. It was these new paradigms and these new markets, which is actually a sharp contrast to probably the B2B strategy where you're going after a specific clear pain point. He's sort of creating something totally, that's new. Totally and Steve was famous, or at least I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but he's attributed to saying if I, if I, you know, if Henry Ford had asked people what they would want, right, they right. would have said faster horses. Right, right. Um, and, you know, this whole notion of sort of having a vision. Uh, and, 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 and so for the B2C markets, is there, is there this idea that those tornado-like effect things 
aren't addressing necessarily just pain points, but they have to do something. I think novel so. And I new think a tornado is a tornado is about something that really is contagious. So what Jeannie just described was an ecosystem. But again, how do you spin up an ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Nokia is trying to spin up an ecosystem. <laughs> Thank you for playing, right? So, 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 so why? They've been trying for seven years, right? And they really have. But again, acquire, engage, monetize, and enlist. So, so somehow when Steve put all this together, he acquired the developers, he engaged the developers, he helped them monetize, and he helped them enlist. Do you think he was thinking about it like that? Well, I'll tell you, the Mac, I think the Macintosh toolbox was the first iteration of that. Yes, I do think he was. Think I think yeah. he, and I, by the way, Microsoft, did it better than Apple did. Mike, and you talk about the great ecosystem of the 90s. That was the Microsoft development, the yeah. developers thing. Yeah, so, and think about it, and he was going up against, against the phone industry who had contained the app to their own store. They jammed it 400 levels down on this phone. They wouldn't let anybody else buy it. And it was, it was a horrible environment for developing apps. So he took a PC industry thing and a telephony thing. He was the first guy to figure out that a, a mobile device is not a phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th I, 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 yeah, 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 okay. We're out of time. We're, 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 I'm 15 minutes over, so I want to take one last burning there, there, was, there was a guy back here, so the, yeah, yeah. A gentleman in the back. We'll go, we'll go to the back. You said for a B2B, you want to be the trailblazer. Um, so would that be contrary to the whole long tail thing? I mean, would you ever apply like a long tail strategy? So the question is, for the B2B, um, we said that you should be the trailblazer. Does that go contrary to the long tail strategy? Yeah, I would say I, w I would not go after the long tail with a disruptive innovation. The disruptive innovation requires too much collaboration with other companies, and the customer's got to bring a ton to the table at the beginning of that. Of that. So I don't think it lends itself to working with the long tail at all. Um, uh, so no, yeah. Yeah. It was, One last burner. Who's got a... Who is it? Oh, no. Okay, we're done. We're burned out. I didn't want to be the second question. Uh, uh, somebody. Who's no, got no, we're, we're done. We're done. Listen, yeah, okay. I'm listening around. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. That was fantastic. That's good. That's good. Okay.